So we're going to talk about sustainable food supply and the role of food in sustainability management. You know, one of the points that I've been making uh, that this course makes, that the program actually makes, is that when we think about management, we have to think about the physical dimensions of sustainability. We have to remember that we are biological creatures. So we need food and air and water or we don't exist. Uh, so this is an important thing to keep in mind. There are challenges to a sustainable food system that we are now facing. Uh, the case studies that we looked at today provided some examples of that. We'll talk about financing sustainable food, organizing and managing uh, a sustainable food supply, and the role of government and public policy in setting up a framework. As I mentioned to you, that my students in the Environmental Science and Policy Program last semester uh, did a project for the mayor's office on where New York City gets its food, because they're thinking in the next New York City plan, NYC 2030, to actually include food sustainability as one of the issues that they focus on. It wasn't in the first plan, uh, but it occurred to the people doing the planning that we need parks and we need uh, to adapt to climate change, and we need water, and we need fresh air, but we probably also need food. Now, New Yorkers um, have an incredible array of food choices, and we actually have a very vibrant system of food supply uh, and delivery uh, and consumption in New York. Uh, many, many different uh, varieties of food and, and a huge market. In fact, one of the questions that I was concerned about was, since we don't grow any food nearby, or at least in the city, um, are we, what happens if the food was interrupted? You know, we've, we've, what happens if uh, the water's interrupted, if the electricity's interrupted? Those are things we've thought about, but what about the food? Well, it turns out our food supply system is probably the, the most phenomenal example of pure capitalism at work that you could imagine. Uh, every major restaurant or, or food retailer, uh, if they can't find something from one supplier, strawberries out of season, there's five other suppliers that are ready to sell them, maybe at a higher price, uh, but it's a very, very aggressive and competitive system. And I, I thought that was interesting. Uh, I hadn't really thought about it in those terms, but it makes a certain amount of sense. The other thing that my students found out was that one of the major costs uh, of the food system in New York City is the cost of parking tickets. Every uh, distributor of food complained about it and talked about that being up to 5% of their cost of doing business in New York. So uh, we're all paying a little tax on that uh, and uh, one way or the other. So let's talk about the role of food supply in sustainability management. Our urban world is increasingly dependent on industrial agriculture for survival. I asked uh, the, the fellow that used to run the mayor's sustainability office, I saw all these green markets all over the city, and I'm saying, this is great, you know, can we get some more of these? Um, and he said, well, I wish we could, but uh, we're out of farms. Every farmer within 150 miles of New York City uh, is selling everything they can grow uh, at the green markets or to the local restaurants that are specializing on local foods. Uh, it's a fad, but it's more than that. It's, it's also a thriving market. And in fact, there's limits to how much of that you can have within uh, the, uh, a close range of New York City uh, because the land is more valuable for living on than growing things on. Uh, the closer you are to the center of New York City, the more expensive the land is these days. So. Uh, that's the problem. We need these food, fa food factories to survive. In developed countries, industrial agriculture is a really good way of producing large quantities of food. So here's some data. Since 1960, milk production has doubled, meat production has tripled, egg production has quadrupled. U.S. factory farming in 2004 provided 3,900 calories per person per day, exceeding demand by 1,000 uh, calories per person per day. So we have an incredibly uh, effective and productive industrial food system in this country. Now, while industrial farming feeds a lot of people and provides lots of calories, it has a lot of negative environmental impacts. The biggest problem is industrial farms rely on unsustainable resources that will eventually be depleted if we're not careful. Uh, fossil fuels, uh, fresh water, arable land. Now, the land and the water 
can certainly be uh, recycled and reused, but the fossil fuels obviously can't. Now, I think that the planet is capable of growing sufficient food for the 7 billion people here now and the 10 billion people that we'll probably have before we peak. But we have to figure out a way to make industrial agriculture more sustainable. Uh, we have to figure out better ways of managing these farms and their impacts. Um, we have to actually start building a sustainable worldwide agriculture system. Now, we don't really know how to do that yet, uh, but we're learning very, very quickly. And I should say that agriculture is one place where there's a lot of adaptation and learning. All of these modern techniques of farming uh, have grown up over the last several hundred years with rapid infusion of new technologies uh, on a regular basis. Uh, it's really a remarkable story of organizations changing. That small family farm that exists in mythology uh, these days in the United States uh, was really the way we farmed, and it's been completely transformed into a different kind of industry. There are some challenges to a sustainable food system, and I want to talk about those. The food system is characterized by a number of environmentally destructive practices. The first, of course, is a massive overuse of pesticides and herbicides. Pesticides are a very easy and low-cost way of ensuring that crops don't get eaten by pests. Uh, that's part of how we manage our farms. Uh, on the other hand, when the, if these pesticides uh, and herbicides are overused, they leach into the uh, nearby streams, they wash off the farms, uh, and they can pollute water. They can also contaminate the ground itself, and they can deplete some of the resources in the ground that contribute to the life of the plants. Um, fertil fertilizers also contaminate freshwater supplies where their high nutrient uh, quantities lead to uh, the kind of phenomenon you see with lily pads growing in a pond or uh, when you see uh, the growth of too much vegetation uh, in, in and around waterways. That's often because those waterways are being overfed by uh, fertilizer nutrients. So we have to advance the technology of fertilizer content and application. We have to make sure through more efficient and more effective uses of fertilizers that it all gets absorbed by the plant and goes into the plant instead of spread all over the environment. Now those are, and, and part of that, and this is where genetically engineered plants comes in, which some people are against, but you can genetically engineer the plant to be a better absorber of the fertilizer. And this is, you know, again, this idea that somehow we shouldn't be doing this stuff is, is really an obstacle to progress, although I should say that the farming industry isn't paying a whole lot of attention to this. They're doing it anyway, because they, they're doing it to reduce cost. They know if they can create a more efficient plant, it's a more profitable plant. Now, sometimes we don't like the way it tastes, and that's a problem for them, so then they work on the taste issues. But all of this uh, engineering is going on uh, all of the time. Another challenge to industrial agriculture is uh, poor irrigation practice. We talked a little bit about that when we were talking about water. It can create the problem of salt water intrusion into the water table, which can ruin a water source. It can also, if the irrigation system gets open to contamination from pesticides and herbicides and fertilizer, it can actually be a way to transport waste throughout the hydrological system uh, and create problems in people's drinking water. So that's one set of problems. The other set of problems is the conversion of forests to pastures uh, and croplands. That uh, the, uh, the balance of local ecology requires a certain amount of different kinds of, of use. And then you also have this problem of monocultures, where the most profitable plant to grow is one thing, uh, but that then leaves you open to attack from uh, parts of the, the ecology that that will become a predator for that particular plant, and then you leave yourself vulnerable to the destruction of both your farm, uh, its production, and the environment surrounding it. So some of these issues are amenable to more intelligent planning and knowledge and thinking through uh, what is necessary to maintain the ongoing production of the plant. This issue of monocultures can be a, a real devastating one. You know, we saw small examples of that here in New York City, something called the Dutch elm disease, where the Dutch elm became a very popular 
uh, tree. It got planted all over New York, as well as a lot of northeastern cities. And then there was a blight that uh, started to attack the Dutch elms. And suddenly, because we had a monoculture, there were no trees in, in neighborhoods. And we've learned now to vary uh, the street trees and the trees that we plant in our park uh, because of that. The question is, can industrial farming adopt the tailored and fine-tuned approach seen in other types of manufacturing? In other words, if you're manufacturing an iPod or a computer, and you have high-tech microtechnology working on production processes at a very fine-grained level, agriculture will need some of the same kinds of thinking to prevent impacts on the environment. Okay, so the, the question is, can that be done? And can sustainability be a goal along with high yield and enhanced profit? There's right now, uh, the industrial farming industry wants to make sure that they get lots of yield and they're making the right stuff that generates what the marketplace wants and they make a lot of money. Those are some of their goals. Could we add sustainability as a goal for industrial agriculture? I think it can be done. But that's where government's going to come in. It's not going to happen through the marketplace alone. We're going to have to figure out ways of adding a dimension of regulation to this uh, so that uh, farms, uh, industrial farms, are, uh, are required to think through some of these practices. So let me talk a little bit about financing. The farm business is a high-risk business. Farming is high-risk because it's at the mercy of a lot of uncontrollable factors. What are those factors? Well, first of all, there's weather. You might have a drought. You might have a freeze. You might have a flood. You might have too much wind at the wrong time of year. I mean, all of those kinds of things. You could have pestis You could have predators that attack your crops. Uh, you could have disease attack your life livestock. There's all sorts of possibility. The other thing is that food takes a while to grow. So there's a there's a sequence where you amass capital by hopefully selling your product, and when you've sold your product, you then buy fertilizer and seed for next year so you can do it again. But what happens if you don't get the price you were hoping for? And so suddenly you see small family farms going under because of that kind of debt structure. So what's happened uh, in the food industry is large mega corporations have taken over in a sense, to smooth out the risk, at least at their level. So they contract with smaller farmers. The smaller farmers sometimes go under, but the large food company has enough farms in enough different places, enough production facilities in enough different places, that it's less risky for them. And they have the capital flow that's needed so that they can weather, literally, uh, a, a bad season uh, in some of their crops. In addition to yearly expenses, farms have long-term expenses. Uh, land, buildings, animals, uh, irrigation, infrastructure, uh, farm equipment. And I don't know if you've seen some of the most modern uh, equipment for harvesting crops or for planting crops, but these can be multi-million dollar machines uh, that are extremely uh, sensitive and difficult to manage, but uh, incredibly productive when they're working correctly and a major expenditure uh, to, to farms. So one of the ways we've dealt with that in the United States is provide, provided a lot of government subsidies. Farm subsidies in 2009 were $15.4 billion. In the United States, uh, because of the geographic base of politics, in other words, you have places like Nebraska and Iowa that have very few people, but, they both, but both of those states have two senators apiece. So farming has a disproportionate impact uh, on the U.S. Senate and therefore in the U.S. political system than in many other places. And it's created a system of subsidies that uh, sometimes don't relate to the needs of the country or the food industry for that matter. Urbanization, new technology, and attempts to control financial risks of farming have led to a century-long decline in the role of agriculture in the American economy. And this is what's most interesting to me about the food industry. Agriculture as a proportion of our GDP has decreased dramatically over the past century. In 1930, it was 7.7% of the GDP, which already represented a significant, significant decline. Now, it's, left, it's less than 1% of the GDP. So here we have something that is a biological necessity for everybody in this room 
you're probably all thinking about, you know, when this class ends, what am I going to have for dinner? Okay, and what you're thinking about is is not even one percent of the GDP of the country. Most of the economic activity in the United States has nothing to do with food. Okay, uh, tell that to a teenager, but uh, it's it's true. Yes. That's grow. That's based on everything. It's based on everything. It's based on the food industry. Okay. So let me just let's go to this next statistic, which will give you an idea of what of why this is working this way. The percentage of workers involved in agriculture has declined dramatically. That's what this is showing. Okay. Now you're saying, are we importing all of our food? Not from other countries. Most of our food in the United States still comes from the United States. A certain amount comes from Latin America. A certain amount comes from, from Asia, but most of it still comes from the United States. The point is, in 1900, 40% of the workers in the United States worked in agriculture, worked in the farm. In 1930, it was 20%, and this year it's 1%. So you see a contracting industry uh, as a proportion of the gross domestic product. And so it's not to say that there aren't, other, there aren't people in food-related businesses. And I'm talking about you know, the agricultural side of it. And the rest of it uh, you know, has grown a little bit. In fact, some of it's grown. I mean, certainly Starbucks has grown a certain amount uh, over the past few years. Large-scale production, as I said, provides protection from the boom and bust cycle that was characteristic of family farming. Demand for food is going to continue to increase as population increases. But a lot of market trends influence what kind of food people eat. So, you know, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, you saw in America a tremendous growth uh, in the consumption of meat. Uh, and that, over the last decade, uh, that certainly has not grown per capita the way it did in those earlier times. The challenge of financing sustainable food, then, is how can farms make a profit despite uh, low food prices and low margins and difficulty in paying back yearly investments without using environmentally harmful methods. I mean, that's one of the problems in a challenged industry, is people figure well, we can lay off some of the costs on the ecosystem, and then we won't have to worry about that, and we can make our money at the end of the year. And it's one of the problems uh, with the food industry. Let's talk about the management issues, because a lot of this is management. Some of it's technology. We do need to develop uh, a better knowledge of ecological impacts and a better knowledge of what kinds of food production processes would have less of an impact. Many agricultural producers and food producers are large organizations. They use cutting edge techniques. They really are large corporations. They use all the techniques of a modern production facility. Our urban lifestyles, most of the people in the United States, as you could see, don't live on farms and don't produce their own food. So we need massive interconnected uh, food production and distribution systems, and we have them. Uh, the, uh, the kind of distribution system for food in New York is unbelievable. Uh, many, a lot of the food comes in uh, through Hunts Point in the Bronx, uh, where uh, it used to be that a lot of the fish would come in through the Fulton Fish Market, but that's moved up to the Bronx also. Uh, and there, is a, there are n a large number of companies at work every night, every morning, with trucks bringing food into all the places you buy it every day. Uh, it's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, an organizational challenge is that a lot of the small organizations that participate in these larger webs can't protect themselves. So the, the small family farmer uh, or the small landholder in India uh, has to deal with uh, the Pepsi Corporation and they have to sell some of, their, some of their product to, to this big company, and the terms of the relationship sometimes uh, is unfavorable. Nevertheless, that's how, it's, that's how it's going to happen. Another challenge is actually energy, because the price of energy affects every aspect of the food production process, from farming itself to distribution of farms, uh, packaging, storing, shipping food over long distances, refrigeration, uh, anybody here use Fresh Direct to, to deliver food to their apartment? Okay. Uh, if you're ever outside in this neighborhood in the evening and you hear something roaring, it's the Fresh Direct truck because they keep the refrigerator on, uh, the freezer on, at, at a pretty high uh, carbon footprint cost wherever they go. But New Yorkers don't have cars and they like to have their stuff delivered to them.
we've got to figure out ways of reorganizing some of these networks to use a little bit less energy, but that's going to happen more when the energy system gets more efficient, not because of the food system. Uh, the, the food system is going to continue to use large inputs of energy. So the question is, can corporations get smarter about their use of water, of fertilizer, of pesticides? Can they analyze their impacts and incorporate those analyses into the agricultural practices? And that's a lot of organizational learning. And you need to figure out incentives for them to do that learning. And so far, uh, we're seeing progress. Uh, and I think, frankly, for a lot of you uh, that will become sustainability professionals, the food industry is going to be looking for people to do this kind of work because I think that it's going to be related to them becoming competitive because the company that can figure out a way to use water more efficiently and pesticide more efficiently and fertilizer more efficiently is going to make a lower cost food product because they're not going to be wasting as much. And again, it goes back to that concept I talked about when we talked about sustainable business. If you think about all of this pollution as a waste, if the plants can absorb and use all of these resources in, the, in growth, then it doesn't go into uh, the, the streams and the waterways and into the environment more generally. And that can make for a more profitable corporation, but you've got to know how to do it. And it's not going to be easy to do. Can small farms survive? I mean, one of the interesting things is that, in fact, the number of farms in the United States increased in the beginning of the 21st century. The number of farms increased by 4%. And part of it is this small farming growth for local green markets and local restaurants. That it's a niche market, but because the number of farms had declined so much, it could have a big impact on this particular statistic. I think you're going to see uh, the same kind of techniques of networks in organizations happen in the food industry even more than you've seen it today. And the reason for that is because the price of information and the price of communication is going down, if the price of transportation continues to go down through the use of containerized shipping and hopefully more fuel efficient transport systems, then you're going to see more and more production of food happening the same way they produce cars. The parts come from 40 different places, and the stuff's assembled in a single place, or two or three. Okay? And so you're going to see those same kind of techniques, I think, happen in the food industry as well. So what about government? What can government do here? Well, first, government has to play an active role in making agriculture more sustainable. And I should say that the traditional role of government in agriculture is just this, bringing technology to bear on food production. The land-grant colleges, all the great state universities in America started as land-grant colleges with a mission of improving local farming. The extension service of the Department of Agriculture, sending people out into the farms with the new technology and new techniques to make farmers more efficient is a deep grain tradition in the agricultural world. And so what's needed here is adding another dimension to this R&D tradition and to this extension tradition of sustainability. We need to develop energy efficiency standards for farms, many of which are exempt. Uh, many farms are exempt from uh, air pollution, water pollution, uh, and energy efficiency standards, and they shouldn't be. This is a residual of the farm lobby uh, and the power of the farm lobby to influence public policy in this country. We need to develop water use standards. You know, water uses, agriculture uses enormous amounts of water. If you could even reduce it a little bit, it would have a tremendous impact on uh, the fresh water supply. And we have to fund basic research and development in agricultural sciences. Uh, that's, always been hap that's always happened in the United States. Uh, it's happened in other countries. It needs to happen even more. Um, and government should develop a set of agricultural rule rules and regulations to manage food markets sustain sustainably. Um, the subsidies we have in the agricultural industry need to be changed. Only 10% of the farms are receiving 61% of government aid. And so it may be that we want to focus these subsidies uh, in a different way. I'd like to focus them on some of the sustainability criteria that can make the uh, agricultural industry uh, less uh, destructive of the environment. 
The government also should be responsible for addressing and limiting agricultural reliance on non-renewable resources such as fossil fuels, emphasize wind power and solar power and uh, biomass and other kinds of uh, renewable resources. One of the biggest problems, though, is pollution from feedlots. The places where uh, meat is produced are among the most uh, polluted places uh, in the United States. They, their pollution is worse by far than many of the industrial facilities that have captured our attention. Uh, and th this is uh, an emerging environmental issue, and we're going to need to pay uh, more and more attention to this going forward. Government needs to take responsibility for helping to develop the technologies that allow agriculture to be sustainable. And again, just as we've seen government intervention in developing the technologies of the internet or the microcomputer or the cell phone, we need to focus a little bit more on uh, the production of food sustainably. As it's no different than any other uh, place where we need to advance R&D uh, rapidly. So let me conclude and then we have some time for discussion. Food is necessary for human survival, that's where I started, it's just like water and air. Food production is becoming less familiar to the world's urbanites. More and more of us are further and further from the production of food. In the last decade, on this planet, we became an urban majority. So the, the disconnect of people from their food supply is only going to grow uh, over time. So we need to think about adding environmental health to the pre-existing priorities of maximizing profit and minimizing costs that we see in the food industry. The food industry is one of the more sophisticated industries in the world. You know, we were, in, at, in the Earth Institute we work with, with Pepsi, which is a, I think a pretty interesting corporation, and uh, they, uh, we were talking once about how difficult it is to get things like fertilizer and other technologies into rural parts of the world where there's limited transportation and uh, difficulties with, with uh, power for refrigeration. But you go to the smallest place, the most rural place uh, in the world, and there's going to be a little grocery store, and they're going to have ice-cold Pepsi right there in the refrigerator. Somehow, Pepsi manages to get their stuff there. And so what about the, the NGOs that are trying to do similar things? You know, what about uh, the places that are trying to bring uh, resources for uh, sustainable farming and so forth. So they can do it, so they know how to do it, and I think we have a lot to learn from these companies because they do know how to do it. So that's basically what I wanted to say about, about food, except one last thing I guess I would add. There is this uh, revulsion, I would say, about industrial farming and applying technology to the growth of food. And I think people are deluding themselves. We are using this technology right now. If it wasn't for the application of technology to farming, what Malthus said was going to happen would have happened. We would have all starved to death by now. And so we have to get past this ideology and this mythology, frankly, because it's not reality-based. So with that, I'd be happy to discuss any issues. Yes.